The great thing about health is that there is constantly new research coming out research that can really take your health to the next level. And today we're going to be focusing on heart health. And I can think of no better person to welcome back to the exam room podcast to help break down some of this new research than the chief of cardiology at Rush University and also the former president of the American College of Cardiology. Ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only Dr. Kim Williams. Welcome back to the show, my friend. Thank you so much, Chuck. Thanks for having me. Let's start with a really interesting study. And this is one that is a large scale study where the authors concluded that vegetables, get this Dr. Williams, do not protect against cardiovascular disease. Now I got my hands on a press release. I know that you have seen the full study, but let me just read you a paragraph out of this press release that absolutely blew my mind. The press release reads, quote, that the consumption of vegetables might lower the risk of cardiovascular disease might at first seem plausible as their ingredients such as carotenoids and others have properties that could protect against CVD. But the evidence from previous studies for an overall effect of vegetable consumption on cardiovascular disease has been inconsistent. Inconsistent? I, I, Dr. Williams, I'm not trying to be biased here, but I have never seen a study that shows anything other than a positive effect on vegetable consumption in terms of heart health. Help me understand this study. Well, it's an interesting study, uh, mostly from, you know, have to get, disclose that I'm a journal editor, and I would I looked at this uh, at the preprint uh, before publication or be, be, before the embargo was lifted, and I just have to say I was just. Uh, kind of blown away by the fact that the methodology included tablespoons, not cups, not cups, but tablespoons of vegetables. And so um, they purported to be studying raw versus cooked, found a little bit of an advantage for raw, not so much for cooked. And, you know, my takeaway was that, you know, the raw data uh, in this project really meant that the conclusions were overcooked. <laughs> and so, and so uh, you know, the other way, the other take that I had on it is that a tablespoon of veggies and a pinch of truth. I mean, I don't know how to uh, interpret it. It, it really is uh, uh, far below what people should be taking in. You know, if you looked at our national guidelines for nutrition, they would say that people should be eating three to four cups of vegetables per day, each cup being 240 ml, each tablespoon being 15 mls. And so they were looking at really a tiny, tiny amount of vegetables um, that, that might have, you know, I would have thought that that somehow was a statistical error um, <clears throat> or a, a printing error, but that's, they seem to be serious about it. But I, I would think that the amount of vegetables uh, taken in might have reached statistically uh, a significant level uh, in terms of a difference or a lack of difference but it was clinically insignificant. It's not something that we would be recommending to our patients. So I don't think that this apply, this study applies to really anyone. So let me, let me just put this in lay terms and make sure that I'm understanding you correctly. Um, the, the study here looked at vegetable consumption in terms of two to maybe three tablespoons per day when it, we're recommended to have what, four cups of vegetables per day, something like that. So we're looking at a fractional amount of our recommended intake of vegetables, and they're still saying this conclusion. To me, sir, that is mind boggling. Again, not trying to be biased, but as you said, it's really kind of confusing how someone could draw that conclusion. And I would think that, uh, and I'm hoping that someone will correct me and send in a thing and, and, and or correct the article either way um, so that we get some meaningful information out of it. Um, but uh, right now, I would say that it's making a lot of news. And um, unfortunately, the news is extracting uh, conclusions that really aren't justified. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, it's uh, glitz that makes the news. And bad science gets published all the time, makes the news regardless of how apical applicable or in this case not applicable it actually is so i'm hoping that um there will be you know retraction or retrenchment or repeat the study um, in another population that is eating it but, but it's very clear that if you're eating you know two to three tablespoons of vegetables whether they're raw or cooked then your outcome is going to be dominated by the rest of what you're eating and so that really needs to be uh, analyzed thoroughly um, before anyone can make any conclusions about nutrition and outcomes. 
Yeah, and, and the authors here said that really when it comes to cardiovascular risk, instead of it being with vegetables, they concluded that it had to do with socioeconomics and other lifestyle factors, which of course, those play a part. But to your point about journalists, being a former newsman, journalists are actually put in almost an impossible situation. Yeah. Most of us are general assignment reporters. So one day we might be covering a court case, the next day we might be covering a fire, and then on this particular day, it would be a study about heart health and no knock on journalists. Very few of us have gone to medical school. We don't know how to interpret this data. So we would rely on these press releases and the press releases have cherry picked quotes like instead our anal analysis showed that seemingly protective effect of vegetable intake against cardiovascular risk is likely accounted for by bias from residual confounding factors related to socioeconomic situations and lifestyle. So, I mean, that's a heck of a sentence for somebody who's not ingrained in the health community to interpret as it is. But then also, as you just said, I mean, it's a, it's a glitzy headline. Vegetables aren't heart healthy after all. Like, I, you know, it's an impossible situation for a journalist. I just wanted to let you know that the journalists aren't out there to get you. Oh, yeah. um, we, we just don't know. We just so, don't know. <clears throat> can I agree and disagree at the same time? That is, I agree By with all means. the journalists. The disagreement is physicians aren't much different. But, you know, you've got somebody telling you to get the patients in and out of your room in the next 15 minutes. Uh, they're going to grab the headlines as well. They're not going to go and look at the paper in detail uh, unless you happen to be very interested in that area. And so, I, you know, I'm, the same is probably true for me when somebody does a, a study on, you know, uh, let's say, say uh, you know, third world countries and parasites. I'm probably not going to read the details of that because it's so far away from what I do. But I'm definitely going to read something about cardiovascular mortality. And so what I get is that if you're talking about two to three, you know, tablespoons of vegetables, the conclusion I would draw is that vegetables do not help your cardiovascular outcomes if you don't eat them. I don't think that there's a better way to sum it up than that. Um, so let's bump to another study, this one looking specifically at hypertension. And I was flipping through your Twitter timeline before our interview. Uh, you retweeted somebody uh, that was talking about how hypertension was a form of cardiovascular disease. Would you agree with that? It is. And, you know, and, and it is the ultimate form. Of, I mean, everyone thinks about heart attacks, you know, stroke and death and uh, heart failure, but uh, hypertension is frequently at the root of all of those, that it stiffens the blood vessels, it promotes plaque so that people do have more heart attacks when, they, when they're uh, significantly hypertensive, and uh, it's obviously a big stroke risk. And so uh, it ruins your kidneys as well, and end-stage renal disease is one of the biggest risk factors for, develop, for rapid development of cardiovascular disease, about 12 different mechanisms uh, of why having bad kidneys makes your heart bad. And so uh, it's really critical that, and in fact, that has been analyzed around the world. World Health Organization data says that the number one contributor to uh, mortality, this is pre-COVID, was actually hypertension because of it, everything else that, that it did. Well, boy, uh, that brings us to the next study, which uh, this one I reported on recently on the show, but I would love to get your opinion on it. And uh, you just talked about the pandemic with hypertension. I mean, this study that was published in the American Heart Journal found that the percentage of adults in America who have uncontrolled blood pressure rose from 15% pre-pandemic to 19% today. That's one out of five almost. And the lay person might say, well, hey, you know, that's that's not that big of a change. But as somebody who really works to combat negative heart health, you know, and improve people's cardiovascular fitness here, that's got to really sound some alarms for you. Well, in a way, but can I put that into perspective for a second? Sure, sure. We're used to some third world countries and our inner cities, in fact, having some 50-50-50 for when it comes to blood pressure, meaning 50% of people who have hypertension know about it. Number two, 50% who, uh, who know about it are actually treated. And then of those who are treated, only 50% are controlled. The interesting thing is that those numbers are skewed in the African-American com community, the most hypertensive uh, population in the United States. It's more like 70, 50, 70, meaning that uh, we have a lot of recognition of blood pressure. People know they have it, but not all of them enough people are being treated and then 70% of the people being uncontrolled. 
And so I think those numbers uh, are getting some better, and uh, at least they were before COVID. We're doing a lot in the communities to try to um, make those numbers uh, much more reasonable. Um, you know, and we in Chicago, we've been working with dental offices, but we need to do the barbershop thing that they did in Los Angeles. And then we need to go to nail salons because the guys don't go there, but the women do. Um, we need community efforts. And uh, the dental office is a great place because, uh, you know, people are usually in pain and scared of the dentist and their blood pressure is going to be a little higher. And that so-called office hypertension or situational hypertension actually predicts future hypertension. Um, so good to identify them there. So, but what you're really talking about is the change that happened with COVID. And that really was a lot of isolation, less exercise, no people are not going to gyms. And, you know, you're gonna see that, you know, 12, 18 months down the road, uh, that COVID-20, um, the increase in weight that people were getting uh, is really going to have its effects, particularly on so-called systemic vascular resistance, uh, air quotes, meaning that as your blood pressure, uh, as you gain weight, your blood vessels will have a higher resistance, which is going to raise your blood pressure. It puts more work on your heart uh, and there's nothing good about it. And people were eating the wrong kinds of foods. We know what produces high blood pressure and that's alcohol, uh, which probably need, deserves a special paragraph because uh, everyone recognized that um, the alcohol um, manufacturers and retailers were going wild um, during COVID because people were staying at home and they were drinking more. So that is in our recommendations, uh, to be honest, our recommendations in our 2017 uh, guidelines, we used the best data that we had uh, you know, from, from 2015 to 2017, which said a woman should never have more than one drink per day and a man should not have more than two. Well, uh, like any guideline committee, we get burned uh, because something else gets published. And so now the recommendation would be that no one regardless of gender, should actually be eating or drinking uh, more than one drink per day. And so we had a lot of people who were overdoing it with alcohol. They weren't exercising. They were eating high fat, comfort, high salt food. And so this is really a natural outcome and we need to reverse it. We need to get the public service messages like you're doing, Chuck, get this message out there to people, whole food, plant-based diet, daily exercise, back off the booze just enough to uh, make sure that the blood pressure is normal. I want to come back to alcohol in just a second, um, but one of the things in this research that the lead author really wanted to underscore was the fact that even a change in just a few millimeters can have a measurable difference in terms of a person's risk for a heart attack or a stroke. How, you know, how little, like if we're talking about jumping from 120 over 80 to maybe 130 over 85, what does that do for a person's risk? That to me, doesn't seem like such an enormous jump, but from a physician standpoint, what's really happening there? So if you look at our 2017 guidelines, you'll see one really shocking thing. That is uh, the increase in mortality starts at like 115. So if that's the baseline uh, for the top number, systolic pressure of 115, for every 15 millimeters, the, the cardiovascular mortality uh, and morbidity doubles. And so people need to understand that this this is a high risk uh, area and we need to keep those numbers as low as we recommend in the guidelines, which is, you know, less than 130 is our target uh, for treatment, but we define uh, anything greater than 120 as elevated uh, with good reason because you can see a little difference. Now, the question is, you know, should you be dr using drugs to get your blood pressure below 130? Uh, or I'm sorry, below 120, probably not. Um, we would prefer lifestyle. Uh, and we, you know, it was so funny when this was just a, a little side note here. Uh, when the guidelines came out, we were immediately accused because we changed the definition uh, and the target from 140 uh, over 90 to 130 over 80. And they said we were in the pocket of the drug industry. And said, that means you didn't read the document because we were talking about decreasing the alcohol I mentioned a limit in sodium to 100 uh, or to 1800 milligrams per day, increasing potassium uh, intake to more than 3500 uh, milligrams per day, changing to a predominantly, if not exclusively plant based diet, doing exercise, getting above 150 minutes and multiple modalities uh, of exercise. Um, and if you do and losing weight, and if you do all those things, most people don't actually need drugs. Uh, but they just need to to pay attention to the lifestyle factors that develop the hypertension in the first place. 
And just as a refresher, this audience, predominantly plant-based, if not exclusively mm -hmm. plant-based, except for a couple of people who just like to, you know, needle us every now and again. <laughs> um, the, the statistics, the data that we have here on a plant-based diet, that effect, a healthy whole food plant-based diet, that effect on a person's hypertension is what? So we have, it's interesting that we have multiple, multiple trials. Um, you know, if you look at uh, that little sign behind you, PCRM, you know, this was an organization that has published multiple risk factors, okay, <laughs> and uh, the effect of diet on and uh, multiple inter interventions. And there's a little bit of diabetes, one publication, massive amount on lipids, massive amount on, um, on hypertension. If you look at those guidelines, and then you look at some of the randomized trials uh, that have been done by PCRM, uh, Neil Barnard, uh, as well as uh, external, it's very clear that the more plant-based you are, the lower the blood pressure. We have massive databases, everything from Harvard's nurses, health and physician uh, health professional follow-up study. You have uh, Adventist uh, make, making a big distinction in frequency of hypertension from whole food, from completely uh, vegan or um, is what they're calling it, but it's more of a whole food plant-based diet versus vegetarian. And, versus, and certainly vegetarian was even better than pesco vegetarian eating fish, which was better than the semi-vegetarian, which was better than uh, a, a standard American diet. So the more you go on that scale uh, toward a whole food plant-based diet, the lower the blood pressure is going to be. All right. Now let's get back to that alcohol uh, talk here, because uh, again, flipping through flip, flipping through your Twitter timeline, I laughed a couple of times, one of which was something that you retweeted. And this was a screenshot of a TV news interview where the banner across the bottom <laughs> said, World Heart Federation, no amount of alcohol is safe for heart. And then the person's actual tweet, the text of that <laughs> read flat out, I do not need this today. That part made me laugh, but right. you know, we again, we've heard uh, previously that wine can be heart healthy. You were talking about limiting alcohol to just one drink per day. You know, what what is your general advice for somebody when it comes to having that beer, having that glass of wine after work every night? So it's an interesting phenomenon, and uh, every once in a while, I have to disclose my conflicts of interest, uh, whether they're they're never financial, but they're certainly intellectual. And mine is, I hate alcohol. <laughs> so I know how people drink it. I can't swallow it. It's just terrible. You know, it burns my mouth, burns my throat, and it puts me to sleep. So I, I, why do people do this? Uh, so having said that out loud, um, I was always looking for that uh, World Heart Federation data for somebody to give us a break. Because all we heard for decades is that uh, alcohol um was going to keep your cholesterol soluble. That, that was actually data from Michigan State's uh, Georgia Bella, where he had cholesterol crystals that could be inhibited by statins and by alcohol. Uh, and then you actually had um, an opp opportunity to, to see data uh, on resveratrol uh, and red wine and the French paradox. And there were always people nipping at the French saying, you know, Maybe it's your diagnosis of heart disease that's a problem way back in the 60s and 70s uh, and that the alcohol isn't really doing much for you. Um, but I think what basically if you if you were to look very hard and very carefully, there really is no benefit of alcohol. Uh, it does kill brain cells, which most of us don't want to afford. Uh, and you never know if you're going to be the person who develops alcohol liver disease with a relatively low amount, which most people don't, but some do, uh, or alcohol, alcoholic cardiomyopathy. But it certainly adds to blood pressure, and it certainly adds to triglycerides, hypertriglyceridemia. You know, the triglycerides don't get a lot of respect, okay? They're sort of the Rodney Dangerfield of the lipid panel. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, people are doing things all the time. First of all, and if I'm, if I'm going off on a triglyceride tangent, I hope everyone has finally heard the recommendation, don't do a fasting lipid panel. I, I see that in all the notes. Uh, and uh, fasting lipid panel is like me ordering a treadmill test and not turning on the treadmill. I want to know what you did in the last 24 hours, and it's going to show up in your triglyceride level. Did you drink? Did you eat ice cream? Did you have cake, pie, uh, refined carbohydrates, sugar? It's all going to show up in your triglycerides. And so fasting would be a good way to try to hide what you're doing. <laughs> so, <laughs> excuse me. So 
you're on a roll, man. Just go with it. Right. So the reason that uh, that triglyceride is so important is because it it makes your LDL cholesterol, the dangerous one, more dense. You have denser particles, and those denser particles actually do make more plaque. So you can have a controlled LDL level that's more dangerous than it would be. So having alcohol, um, and you know, we used to give a lot of credit since I'm on a a lipidology role here uh, of what's new and that everybody should know is one of the things that people thought would happen with HDL uh, uh, cholesterol is that it goes up with alcohol. And, and so that, therefore, alcohol is good for you because your ha H or happy cholesterol, the high density lipoprotein cholesterol goes up. Well, now we have two huge studies, Can Hart and Copenhagen, both saying, what? We know why every drug that ever was designed to increase HDL didn't work if there was if it either didn't decrease anyone's death rate or it actually increased it. And so the, you know, these major pharmaceutical companies have sort of stopped doing it now. What was very clear uh, is that the uh, higher the HDL, the more the heart attack rate. So we had it wrong for 60 years. And so adding alcohol to try to raise your HDL was never a good idea. We just didn't know it. So I'm, I'm good to, it's, I understand that it's hard for physicians and patients uh, to have something that gets flipped around like that. But that's the reality. Medical knowledge doubles every 73 days. And a lot of it is undoing stuff that we had wrong in the first place. Is, is that, is that just a saying or is that a fact? Medical knowledge doubles every 73 days. That's no, well, uh, the funny part is I haven't checked that in about 73 days. So it might be less than that now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, that's funny. Uh, okay, so alcohol, definitely a buzzy topic. You know what else is burning up the uh, the old health hotlines right now is olive oil. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of evidence now coming out showing that there is a positive association with health and olive oil. That is something that has been hotly debated, especially in the plant-based circles. What is your opinion on olive oil consumption? Is this something that, yeah, it's okay to have some, it's okay to have a lot, or don't have it at all? So it's interesting that, um, uh, and you're absolutely right, that this has been going back and forth on the topic, um, and I was kind of in the middle of it because I'm a journal editor uh, for these kinds of articles, and, you know, I called them the vegan wars, and first of all, I try to tamp everybody down and say, you know, everybody's pushing something in the plant-based nutrition world um, that is helpful to their patients. They've seen the beneficial effects, and I, you share more health then you are going to, you know, then, then the kinds of things that are going to divide you. And it's basically on oils, nuts, and seeds, uh, and, uh, and avocados. And what is it all about? Well, it turns out <clears throat> that they, we have some very prominent people who say you shouldn't do those things, and other very prominent people who say you should. Um, <clears throat> when you look at the data, uh, it's very clear that monounsaturated fat and polyunsaturated fat actually lowers uh, LDL cholesterol. And so, and lowers mortality. Now, the people who are saying don't eat them, uh, they've got a couple points. Number one is that it's a substitutionary benefit. That is, yeah, if you su substitute <clears throat> monounsaturated fat or polyunsaturated fat for saturated fat uh, in animal products, you're going to show a benefit. But if you're doing a whole food plant-based diet, then you actually don't have that benefit. Um, you know, that's one argument. Uh, the other side, the other argument that I'm sure you've heard is the fat you eat is the fat you wear. I think that was attributed to John McDougall or one of his uh, <laughs> uh, followers. And um, that calorically is actually true. That is, it's, you know, oils are calorie dense. Uh, but if a person is thin, uh, their cholesterol is elevated, and they're exercising well, uh, there, there probably are some benefits to olive oil, canola oil, um, and, and avocados. I, I recently saw a, uh, a randomized trial about avocados that actually, and you know, my disclosure here is I really don't like avocados. <laughs> but I'm going to have to start eating them because they lower cholesterol really well, about 15 points in, on average in a randomized trial. That's, that's, too, that's too big to ignore. That is, uh, 15 points is about halfway uh, to the one millimole level. Uh, which lowers cardiovascular events by 22 percent. That's that's too too big to try to ignore. So uh, I think um, uh, one of the issues that I see is that uh, it's hard. And people will say, "Why don't I have a book?" Well, the reason I have a book is because I'm wrong about so many things. When you ask me my opinion, I don't really have any opinions uh, other than my own personal taste. No alcohol, hate out of avocados, that sort of thing. Um, but my opinions about medicine are all colored by randomized trials. 
and the trials will change. And so uh, I don't want to write a book simply because I know that I'd be wrong on, on so much of it in a couple of years. Um, but it also makes it hard for you to, once you put something in print, it makes it hard to morph that. And as I congratulate the people, if they are writing a book, who write another book <laughs> and, and you know, will change some things because the, the field keeps changing so rapidly. I mean, I had no idea that avocados were going to lower LDL by that much until it was published. This portion of the exam room podcast brought to you by Haas Avocados. Dr. Williams swears <laughs> by them and so should you. Um, <laughs> I don't have to eat them. Can I take it intravenously or something? <laughs> I'll take an IV drip of guacamole, please. Oh, my goodness gracious. Um, I, we got an interesting question here. Uh, we have just a couple of minutes left. Thank you so very much for being generous with your time. We got an interesting question from a viewer not too terribly long ago, uh, talking about how when he adopted a, a whole food plant-based diet, had his sodium levels checked and they were too low. And he's now conflicted because he hears all of these people in the plant-based community saying, hey, no salt, no salt, no salt. But his doctor's like, hey, it's also unhealthy to have sodium that is this low. You know, you don't have to give advice to this specific individual, but by and large, if a person gets their levels checked and their sodium is too low, what advice would you have for them? So they really do need to, to work with their doctor and make sure they don't have a, a serum um, that is uh, the syndrome of inappropriate ADH, that's antidiuretic hormone, which can drop your sodium. Uh, there are other things that can do it, um, but uh, like taking a diuretic or taking multiple diuretics will do that. I'm assuming the patient has ruled that stuff out. Uh, so that, that is someone who really needs to have an, uh, uh, an evaluation because kidneys are pretty smart. They say, oh, the serum sodium is a little low. I'm going to conserve sodium. And it actually does work pretty well unless you poison them by using that lightly uh, or physiologically, not really uh, poison them. Uh, with a, uh, a drug that changes how they are, are behaving. And so, if, yeah, if you're on drugs, you have to watch your sodium, your potassium, your magnesium, uh, and your physician should be following that if you need those drugs. Um, but I would say, you know, follow up and, and, and because that's an unusual response to diet. Uh, a dietary sodium, there's enough sodium in most things to keep you from getting hyponatremic, as it's called. And it's also dangerous, by the way. Um, uh, that is, the, there is a neurologic um, syndrome that people don't want to hear. It's uh, central um, pontine myelin, myelin uh, deficiency that actually happens if you replete the sodium very quickly in someone whose sodium is very low. So it's something that you really don't want to go through. Yeah, I've heard uh, people getting in trouble for drinking too much water in a short amount of time as well, uh, really diluting their, their sodium levels. I thought that that was a pretty interesting thing there as well. But I want to end with you on a serious note, obviously, February, African American History Month here. And I was speaking with Dr. Columbus Batiste not that long ago, and I got some feedback from a listener who said, well, first of all, thank you so very much for, for doing the show. But number two, they said it's pathetic that we have to keep banging the drum for this to keep opening people's eyes to the fact that there are still racial disparities out there in terms of health. And so, number one, just from a physician's standpoint, I know that this problem is enormous and it's there's so many just multifaceted many times over when it comes to correcting this issue. But from a physician standpoint, I mean, where can one even just start trying to correct this this abomination? Well, I, I think you've set it up really well, Chuck. Um, you've got to start in your own cleaning up your own backyard. And that is um, <clears throat> we I, I recently took the role of associate dean for um, uh, diversity, equity and inclusion for the faculty. And even among you know, faculty members, there are uh, implicit biases that make their jobs you know, not what they would like them to be. And so everyone would like to see us recruit more, develop more, and expand the pipeline so that there are more physicians. Why? It's because our Hispanic patients really want to see Hispanic doctors and African-Americans really want to see African-Americans. And it would be great if we had changed the culture so much that the, the ethnicity of the physician doesn't actually matter, but there actually is, it's, it's actually ethnicity and gender. Really good data, unfortunately, um, uh, that says that if I am seeing an African-American male patient, he's more likely, 20% more likely to follow my advice because I'm an African-American male. You know, I, it would be great to get over it, but we've got a long history to try to struggle through 
to uh, remove implicit biases and so many uh, societal factors uh, that have led to structural racism that uh, people are feeling every day. And so it was brought out, you know, during the whole George Floyd and Black Lives Matter, but sure, it was even brought out more by COVID and the fact that um, there were more people of color who were dying and it had to do with socioeconomics, not race, it was risk. Uh, and and as, and the, the risk were cardiovascular risks uh, factors that, that I know uh, another shout out to PCRM that there, I, I saw a, a flyer from PCRM about three weeks into the pandemic saying fruits and vegetables uh, to lower your hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, had to see what was coming because, you know, these are these uh, doing a whole food plant based diet lowers your inflammation for just just that one thing, but also lowering the risk factors and in, in including obesity. Well, it turns out after all the data has been analyzed, that was completely true. Um, everyone should see the publications. There's multiple of them now. Uh, probably the most famous quoted one was in the British Medical Journal, I think, in November or so of last year, saying that people who are doing a, a plant based diet are 73 percent less likely to develop moderate to severe illness with COVID. And if you were doing that keto diet uh, that we were all fighting against as much as we could, you know, not just because I, I always tease that if you're you know eating nothing but you know, bacon and steak and that like, you know, the mortality rate is 100 percent for the cow and the pig. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so it turns out uh, the mortality rate with COVID for the humans who were eating, it was actually pretty high, too. And so uh, about a 50 percent increase in bad outcomes. And so, you know, it's so critical. Um, I, I call it the dual pandemic. And, you know, how do we dual the dual pandemic? is to change the diet and change our exercise habits. Uh, and we would do much, we would have done much better with COVID if everybody was listening to PCRM and everyone who was promoting a plant-based diet way back then. Yeah, I remember that early data coming out of New York City where they had just that terrifying surge at the beginning of the pandemic. And to the credit of the health officials up there, they released all of the comorbidities of the patients they saw that were dying from COVID-19. And so many of them are conditions that we know uh, we see great benefit when applying that whole food plant-based diet, especially whole food plant-based diet. You know, we know that it's really good, as we talked about today, for heart disease, hypertension, obesity, uh, cognitive decline, Alzheimer's disease, so many of these different conditions, and we're just checking so many boxes. So even though we didn't have that firm data up front, we did know for a fact that at least in terms of these comorbidities, yeah, what you eat absolutely matters. And you would be in a really good way to go ahead and start loading up on more than two to three tablespoons of vegetables <laughs> every single day. Um, and then final thing, just clear cut, to those who still think that 100% of the disparity in health is attributable to genetics, um, I think it's so important that we dispel this myth is that even though African Americans absolutely have higher rates of heart disease, hypertension, obesity, African Americans also not genetically more uh, susceptible to having these diseases. It's, it's a product of a lot of other uh, reasons, correct? Uh, that is correct. Let me harken back to what you were saying just a moment ago, um, because I, I mean, we talked about you know hypertension, obesity, uh, hyperlipidemia uh, as risk factors for COVID outcome, but there uh, and being changed by diet. It also could have been changed. Did you know, Chuck, by vegan poop pills? Have you heard I'm of that? I'm sorry. What? Say this again now. Vegan poop pills? No. Okay. No, no. So what basically uh, I'm referring to is we had all these studies uh, that PCRM has done a lot of them showing the effect on those risk factors of a whole food plant-based diet. But we didn't have all the reasons why. And so at the more recent conferences at PCRM and elsewhere, you will see talks on the microbiome. That is, everybody's got you know bacteria on their skin, bacteria in their mouth, bacteria in their GI tract. The ones in the GI tract determine just about everything. The list of, uh, of diseases that are controlled by your microbiome is as long as your arm. It's almost unfair to speak about as a cardiologist because it's neurology, it's multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, all being created by the products of the microbiome. Well, when you eat decaying car carcasses, you get a bad microbiome. When you eat a whole food plant-based diet, you get a really good one. And the FDA has approved uh, vegan poop pills 
for diseases such as Clostridium difficile, um, but you could also get you know, uh, a healthy microbiome from a, a, a spouse as well uh, for fecal transplant. But the fecal transplant or, uh, or <coughs> the uh, microbiome adjustments that people can make uh, just by changing to the diet are really dramatic. And it turns out that everyone, uh, lay people have heard the word cytokine storm which is what happens when people end up dying of COVID. Uh, they're overwhelmed with inflammation. Guess where it comes from? The microbiome. And that's why people do so much better. And so then I know that's fascinating data and I hope everybody uh, recognizes that they really should change the bacteria and the best way in their GI tract and the best way to do that is a whole food plant-based diet. Now, having said that, it does play into the diet in the, in the African-American community. And so you're absolutely right that uh, the genetic differences between whites, blacks, Asians, uh, Hispanics are tiny uh, and they are things that are superficial. The more, the, and there are a handful of things that are more likely to happen in an African-American, um, like sickle cell disease but that, and thalassemia, but those could be Mediterranean people as well as African, uh, African-Americans. Uh, the APOL1 gene, that's the one exception that I would say, Chuck, where there is a difference between blacks and whites. That is, you go into a, you know, a mixed race neighborhood, go into the dialysis center, and it's all black people. Well, that 35%, being 13% of the population uh, in the United States and 35% of the dialysis patients is partly because of a, a gene called the APOL1 gene. And you, you're either gonna genetic test every black person to see if they have it, or put everybody on a whole food plant-based diet because what's very clear from the kidney literature, and this is another one of those disconnects that I just don't understand, for Kidney International, kidney.org, um, the National Kidney and Di Diabetes Foundation, all of these major societies and uh, organizations are pointing out that animal protein is toxic to kidneys. And if, if you stop feeding people animal protein, they will not end up on, with end-stage renal disease on dialysis. Why is it so important? Because every dialysis patient qualifies for Medicare. Medicare is going broke. Uh, and you know to have $91,000 per beneficiary every year uh, until they pass away, typically of heart disease, is just too much of a burden. So everyone, if they care at all about the finances of the country, they'll stop eating animals and stop it today. Dr. Kim Williams, we're going to leave it right there. But my friend, I feel like I could talk to you forever. Uh, just what a fascinating conversation. I can't believe this half hour and change went by as quickly as it did. But uh, I'm so very grateful that you were able to join us today. Thanks. You. Thank you so much for having me, Chuck. It was, it's always a pleasure. If your health IQ was a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.